and we're live. The chair notes the time is six o'clock, uh, six o four. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, as ZBA chair. I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. Mr. Everald Henry. Here. Mr. Philip White. Here. And Mr. David Slobiter. Here. Quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is uh, Jacinta Williams, a town planner. Um, I think Nate Malloy will join us later, as well as Carolyn Murray of KP Law to provide us guidance and assistance. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff, and they may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing after which the board will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. If the, the chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of hearing to file the decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the filing of the variance to file its decision. No, no decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2025-04, Wayfinders Inc. requests a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct a 31 unit mixed income rental housing project in a three story development on 14 proposed, with 14 proposed parking spots on the premises of 31 Southeast Street, map 15A, parcel 20, in the RVC or Village Center Residence Zoning Districts, and a 47 unit mixed income rental housing project in a three-story building with 46 proposed parking spots on the premises of 70 Belchertown Road, map parcel 15C58, 15C59, 15C60, in the RN and FPC, neighborhood residents and flood prone conservancy zoning districts. This matter is continued from our October 10th, 2024 meeting. Following that, public comment on any matter not before the board tonight and other business not anticipated within 24 hours. The first item on the agenda is ZBA FY 2025-04, Wayfinders Inc. requesting a comprehensive permit uh, project at 31 South East Street and 70 Belchertown Road. Tonight's hearing, um, we have topics as follows. The presentation from both, on both sites from the application selection process and local preference is the second issue. 
The third is outstanding questions from our last meeting. That includes a rental application. Um, we want to view a rental application, comparison of inspections from states and other regulatory agencies, exact lengths from the, each of the runs of the BRF to the terminal units and the HVAC roof configuration, the uh, report on how the neighbors feel about the effect of the lighting plan and the spill under the properties, and lastly, clarification on the areas of photometric plans for both sites where the numbers appear above average. What's the cause of this? What's happening? And are these areas designated crossing or high traffic areas? And following that, to the extent we have time, we'll begin the discussion of the waiver requests associated with this permit application. Uh, do any members of the board have disclosures to make? Mr. Henry, I think you do. Um, you've submitted your Mullins form, right? I have, yes. And that's just to verify that I, I missed the September 19th meeting and I have watched or recorded. So the, we want to inform the applicant that the members who missed a single session of the public hearing on this 40B application have reviewed all the materials in the missed session completed their certification, which will be filed with the town clerk. Accordingly, Mr. Henry remains eligible to participate in the board's decision on this matter. And I know two other members of the board who have missed a meeting are in the process of doing the same thing. So they will be good for the rest of the, pro they're good for this meeting and we know they'll be good for the rest of the process. Great. Um, the next order of business is to go through submissions since the, um, since our last meeting. And I think the only submission that we have since the last meeting has been a, from the applicant is a sample application form that we received. And uh, there's a staff submission, which includes a revised schedule of hearings on this comprehensive permit and the topics to be discussed, as well as a, uh, a second uh, on general schedule for the ZBA. I don't think there's anything else in terms of submissions that we have to review. Is there, Ms. Williams? No, but just for the record, I also forwarded the uh, Mullins certification from uh, KP Law, just to put that on the record as well. Great. All right. So um, this meeting is to go over two topics for sure, which is the application selection process and local preference. And then we want to get uh, follow up on those um, remaining questions from our last meeting. And I anticipate that we might have some time and in the interest of trying to move this application along as expeditiously as possible, we'll start the process of reviewing the waiver requests from the applicant. Um, we won't decide on those tonight. Obviously, this is that process will go on at a later point in time. We may take consensus um, views, but the official action on these waivers will will happen at a later date, this will be the time to start that process of reviewing the waiver requests. All right, so Mr. Gruber, or who's going to run through the, ap the application process, so application selection process. Sure, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Gruber. I'm here on behalf of Wayfinder 1780 Main Street uh, in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and yeah, we can start out with the uh, with the application process. I have a, a couple slides prepared for that, and um, and uh, local preference. So I will share my screen. Okay, can you all see my screen here? Yep. Okay, great. Um, so the application process um, will start. Uh, we'll, we'll start um, approximately seven months before construction completion. Um, we'll start uh, with our with our marketing. Uh, our affirmative marketing begins there um, for um, those I guess least likely to apply. Um, Six months before the um, prior to construction completion, we'll um, issue the application, the information session dates, the application deadlines, the lottery dates. Those are all announced six months in advance, and then in that 
time period in four months, you know, within four months of the construction completion, there'll be information sessions held. Um, typically, there'll be, you know, two or, or three of those. Um, one of those um, may, you know, maybe in uh, uh, Spanish as well. Um, the, and then two months ahead, um, there's the there's the application deadline, and um, the the qualified applicants will be assigned a number in um, for for a lottery. And then one month ahead of the construction completion, or around that time, a lottery is held. And um, and then after that, the the um, the participants the the applicants whose numbers were were chosen in that lottery, um, they'll you know there's a process to kind of qualify. Um, you know, process the qualified applicants, and then the the residents would move in. Um, we submitted the uh, sample application form um, that the applicants would be able to fill out. Um, that's what was submitted um, for the board's review. Um, the marketing uh, of the units, you know, it, it typically includes press releases. Um, in in local papers and flyers and brochures on social media, uh, on the Wayfinders website. Um, there's also a housing uh, navigator site that is, um, has, has been developed to list uh, uh, affordable, um, affordable rental properties um, in, in Massachusetts that, that are available so that they can kind of keep uh, one database and make it um, easier for residents to find uh, available um, affordable housing. And there's also uh, outreach through uh, uh, other organizations, um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the local areas as well. Um, here's sort of a, a sample flyer you might see. You may have a, a photo rendering of the property, some, some details as to, um, you know, what, what, what's included with the rent. Um, some information about the, you know, eligibility of applicants and, you know, how they, how they can apply. And then we have a, a small little video here that, that can kind of go. Can you all hear the audio on this? Can you hear the audio in the video? Yeah, I can. When completing your application, be sure to answer every question. If a question does not apply to you, you can mark it not applicable, or NA. Do not mark NA over entire sections or pages of the application. Mark each question and each section individually. Please include all of your contact information, address, phone numbers, and email, so we can reach you in case we need additional information to process your application. We may also need to contact you with updates to the application, lottery, or screening process. When you submit your application, we date and timestamp it. Your application is then reviewed for completion. If it is complete, it will be assigned a lottery code. If it is incomplete, we will notify you so that you can complete it. This is one important reason to make sure you always include all your contact information on the application. After you submit your application, you will receive a confirmation letter in the mail within 30 days. This letter will include your unique lottery code. Lottery process. We use a lottery system to create a list of all completed applications. Your unique lottery code is entered into the lottery. These codes are randomly ordered, and this becomes the initial waiting list for the property. All applicants on the list will receive a unique confirmation letter telling them their initial waiting list position. This list, using your unique codes, will also be published on our website. After the lottery, we will schedule screening appointments for the applicants in the top section of the list. These applicants will be notified of the date and time scheduled for the screening appointment. Applications received after the deadline for the lottery will be added to the end of the waiting list chronologically, based on the date and time of their application. Screening process. When your application is near the top of the waiting list, Wayfinders will contact you to make a screening appointment. There are many important documents you will need to present during this appointment. Please be sure to get organized before your screening appointment. We will ask you to provide identification, like birth certificates, social security cards, and picture IDs. Income information, like benefit letters, pay stubs, employment offer letters, self-employment income verification, 
tax return documents, student financial aid, child support, alimony, or documents for any other income your household receives. Asset information, such as bank accounts, real estate information, whole life insurance, stocks, bonds, or prepaid debit cards. We also require five years of landlord history, and we perform a credit and background screening. We do not obtain your credit score, and it is not a hard inquiry on your credit. We gather information about your credit accounts, public records, housing court, or criminal records. Once we have completed the screening process, you will be assigned a unit number, and the application packet will be submitted to the Wayfinders Compliance Department for approval. When you are approved by Wayfinders and you accept your new apartment, we'll let you know when you can move in. Please note that some units and new developments have rental subsidies attached to them. This means that if we determine you may qualify for one of these units, you will need to go through an additional screening. We'll reach out to you if that's the case and guide you through that process. After the screening. When all available units are filled, all remaining eligible applicants will stay on the waiting list based on their original placement in the lottery. If an applicant is offered an apartment but turns it down, that apartment will be offered to the next eligible applicant. We hope this video has helped you understand why it is important to complete your application and informed you about the selection process for an apartment in this development. So that was the, um, you know, a, a video that uh, the residents or, or the uh, the applicants are able to watch um, in as, you know, as part of the um, application process. And, um, and then the other topic that we were going to discuss this evening was uh, local preference. So the executive office of housing. Well, let, let's do the, I want to talk about that, but let's talk about the selection process first and then. I know this plays into it, but let's talk, go through the process first in case anybody has questions, Mr. Gruber, is that all right? So can you push your first, your first um, screen up and that would be, that material wasn't, I, I couldn't find that material in the application. Can you send it to the staff and they can just uh, send that to us electronically at uh, some later point in case we need to go back and look at it? Sure. Yep. Yeah, that would be helpful. All right, so who, do you, affirmative marketing begins. That's where you, you, you work with other agencies, um, organizations to try to identify people that are least likely to apply. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, could I jump in, Jamie? Yeah, Amanda. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Amanda Bubon here, uh, Vice President of Compliance for Wayfinders uh, yeah. from 1780 Main Street, Springfields. Um, so affirmative marketing is uh, part it, part of the original application for funding and everything like that, we have to develop a tenant selection plan and an affirmative marketing plan. So the affirmative marketing plan comes from evaluating the census tract data for the demographics for the town and then for the county and then for the state. Through that, we determine what populations of, of uh, minorities are least likely to be applying in the town, right? And then you have to uh, you have to target those groups in the affirmative marketing. So when we do that analysis, if we can see that maybe the percentage of Hispanics in the county is much higher than the percentage of Hispanics in the town, we would know that to get more Hispanics in the town, we would have to target by going out to Spanish publications, newspapers, radio stations to market to that specific population to try to diversify the property. Um, so we do that analysis and then we identify which groups of um, people are least likely to apply based on what percentage there is. And that's how we determine um, what groups we're gonna market to. And then from there, we identify which newspapers or you know, websites or community uh, groups that are out there that uh, service that my, that uh, demographic, um, and we and we'll market there. So we'll put the print ads out. We'll put the radio ads out. Um, we'll send out flyers and pack application packets to those community contacts. And do you do that yourself, or are you working with other groups as well in the, in the various communities? 
Uh, we mostly we're we're solely responsible to ensure that it happens and to be in compliance with it. So like we do work with other organizations, we'll reach out, you know, for accessible units to, you know, disability groups or to, you know, um, a department of mental health if we're targeting like it's it all depends on what we're targeting, who we're going to go out and reach out to. But we do that work mostly ourselves. We do all the advertising. All right. And then you hold information sessions, correct? Yeah, I think and David you, you, has you, a question maybe before we. Yes, Mr. Sloboda. I do. I don't know if I'm the only one who doesn't get this. On the seven month line, is that a typo? Should it be least likely to apply or yeah. what, is least, <laughs> what is a least likely? Yeah, it's at right least problem. with a T. Least, with a T. There's a, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's supposed to be a T. So you want to reach people who are not likely to apply under under normal circumstances. Correct, yes. And Good. the timeline for all of this comes from HLC directly. EOHLC has set timelines for, if you're anticipating to get certificates of occupancy for the buildings at this day, you have to start. So the affirmative marketing comes first. We target those groups, we market to them for 30 days prior to like just general marketing everywhere else. Thank, thank you. Yeah. And and Ms. Bubon, they you determine who are the least likely to apply by looking at the population in the town as compared to the the county and the state. Is that right? Or do you is there some other way that you judge whether some group is least likely to apply? Yeah, that's correct. It's an analysis based on the most recent census track data. There's actually like a HUD form for this. And it's a very it's a very specific process. There's charts we have to fill out, uh, backup that we have to provide, um, and things like that to demonstrate what's the what the percentages are. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Other board members have questions about the, the marketing prior to construction. I I, I have a Mr. couple Mr. Of White. questions. Um, Oh, excuse me, Mr. Henry. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I, um, I thought Mr. White had his hand up. Sorry. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I believe I heard, um, I'm sorry, Mr. Gruber said that there may be an informational session, one in Spanish. Um, and I think I learned this last week that I believe the town has translation services that's not just limited to Spanish. So I'm not sure if this is something that you guys may want to look into and see if there's opportunity to broaden that language barrier to something other than just Spanish. I believe every department in the town I was told has like instant translations for languages other than um, Spanish. So I just want to put that out there. <clears throat> and my my second question, um, so I, I, I glanced at the application briefly, and so I understand reaching out to people who are least likely to apply, um, but do, does that factor in people that um, are, for lack of a better term, homeless? Um, because um, one of the things that um, I saw in the application was that you guys require five years of lease history or rental history. And some people may not have that because they would have either been living with family because they couldn't afford their own place or recently lost their home. Um, how do you guys navigate that? And what do you guys do with those kind of situations? Yeah, so um, in general, with the landlord history, uh, we know that there's going to be some folks out there that just don't have landlord history. They may be in shelter placements, they may be bouncing around, they may be homeless, they may be freshly 18 and lived with their parents their whole lives. Um, you know, so if if a applicant can't provide the five years of landlord history, we move to personal letters of recommendation. Um, we'll accept three letters of references in lieu of landlord history. Uh, we don't accept from friends or family. It has to be like community contacts or 
colleagues or supervisors or, you know, some type of uh, relationship that you have besides this is my best friend or this is my sister or my child um, that will vouch for your character, your reliability, that kind of thing. So we do give them alternative means of, of, you know, showing their history of where they're at. We do actually the same thing with credit. Um, to be honest, we include a section on our applications and screening where people can provide personal credit references in addition to just the credit reports that we run. So if they have things like car insurance that they've had for years that they've always paid in time, or they buy things through like Rent-A-Center that they're paying on time every month, we'll take that as well to show that they're going to be reliable in making their payments and, and fulfilling their financial obligations if their credit history isn't long enough or there isn't any or if it's not so great. Um, so we try to really work with people to get them housed. Um, and, and also, typically, uh, most of our new developments include some units that have homeless preference. So uh, those applicants would be screened first for those units prior to applicants that are already in secure housing. Thank you. And, 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 and within that category, there's, I, I also saw that there is um, a, a criminal background check as well. And so are, are there certain things that would disqualify a person based on prior history with the law? Um, I, I know this is state funded, town funded, and um, I, I saw one about um, SORB um, on there, a big question about SORB. Um, are are there are there certain things on a person's quarry that would automatically disqualify them? So uh, for for us, we don't run quarries. Uh, we don't we don't have that authorization oh, to I'm run sorry, actual not, not full quarry, quarries. like a, a court, like a, yeah. a background check. Um, yeah. So we use a screening software tool. Uh, it's called First Advantage Safe Rent Core Logic. It has goes by different names. It runs. It does pull criminal history um, if they have like arrest records and things like that, but not to the extent of a quarry. Um, it does do a multi-state sex offender registry search, and we follow the program regulations for those things. So certain programs have uh, certain restrictions for that. Like if it's a project-based subsidy, um, they have a restriction where you cannot receive subsidy if you have a lifetime sex offender registry requirement. Um, uh, and then with, with the subsidies also, they have much more uh, clear-cut guidelines on um, the amount of arrests you've had, if you've had felony convictions or misdemeanors of this type within this many years. Uh, we don't really have that in-depth of a screening because we don't do quarries. Um, we just use that background tool, so it will alert us if there's things going on so that we could be mindful of them. Uh, but we also have to be really careful because, uh, you know, there is there is a detrimental effect on on people statistically sometimes that creates kind of like fair housing issues, right? Because statistically, this demographic of people may be more likely to have criminal history. So HUD has issued a lot of guidance about that over the past uh, probably five to seven years on how to really screen to find good quality people that can follow the rules, pay the rent, and um, and be compliant without causing a disparate impact on those groups that may be more likely to have that kind of history. Okay, thank you. And um, <clears throat> so I, I think my the other part that I heard was it's town, county, and state. So if I understood correctly, if we, in, in thinking about um, the application process for um, your screening, if you don't have enough applicants, say in Amherst, then you will widen that to a countywide and then state if necessary. What, for advertising? For the, for, the, for the census track. Yeah. Yeah, no. So the the mm -hmm. census track, so the when we're preparing an affirmative marketing plan, it's a very specific HUD form. Um, that you have to fill out. So you just fill out all the blanks. And when you get to that chart that has to do with the census track, you have to run the local census track. And then there's a column for this is the immediate area. This is the expanded area. This is the, the state. 
So you put the numbers in each column from the census tract data into that sheet. And then when you see which of the local, it's basically like what, what Amherst numbers are in comparison to the county, to the state. And if Amherst numbers are lesser than the county or the state in that category, we would effectively include those that category in our affirmative marketing. Thank you. So uh, can I just follow up on one of Mr. Henry's questions? Um, mm -hmm. So you said that there are criteria that you have to follow, it sounds like from federal law, about what um, the number or the types of criminal convictions that disqualify people. But you don't know what those are, or is, or is is that something that you, that uh, is determined by the fe by the federal government when you look for a subsidy? How how does that work? Because I I think your concern that you express is a really good one, and about the disparate effect on various populations. And I I want to make sure I, I just want to understand it better because I don't want to further that disparate effect. Yeah, so we internally at Wayfinders do not have a set protocol that we're going to decline someone if they have X, Y, or Z in their history. Um, we just, we don't do that. We don't do quarries. Um, I don't you know, know what a quarry is. Check, yeah, like we certainly. I don't know what a quarry is. Uh, so a quarry is a criminal offense record inquiry through the Mass Department of Justice. It's like a okay. you're inquiring for their criminal history and their full record of arrests and everything like that. Um, the subsidy programs absolutely do that because there's very strict federal guidelines about subsidy and and those types of uh, offenses and things like that. We at Wayfinders we don't process them that way. So I mean for lack of a better way to say it, like everybody has a chance in our eyes. Like, you know, everybody has an opportunity to change. Everyone has an opportunity yeah. to have a second chance in life, to have a good secure place to live where they can thrive and not just survive and, and stuff like that. So we don't have a set decline for criminal history. It usually comes from the subsidy department for the subsidized units that they can't approve them for that subsidy. So that's for your 30% units, 30% of area median income. That's the group that would be most likely to be, somebody might be uh, rejected at the federal level because of some, some history. You're not, making, you don't make that decision the subsidizing agency makes that decision. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, is that's that just correct. for the 30% or is that for the 50, 60, and 80% as well? The, the 50, 60, and 80% units would pass our, you know, they would go through our, our screening. Yep. Um, some of them may have also been through that same screening because they come with mobile vouchers, mobile Section 8 or MRVP vouchers or... There's so that, many different mobile vouchers out there now. Done before they arrive to you. They would, yeah, they would get it. So uh, typically the only people who wouldn't go through kind of that vetting process would be someone coming in that is eligible based on the income limit for the unit that can afford to pay the rent for the unit that doesn't have any type of subsidy involved at all. Okay. All right. Other questions regarding the uh, marketing? So the next question I have is, seems to me you're going to have five buckets, five lotteries. Is that right? You'll have a lottery for the 30%, a lottery for the 50, the 60, the 80, and, and the market rate. Or how does that work? So um, there's actually just... Well, there would be two lotteries here because there's a local preference and then there's there's non-local preference, right? right? So when we do, we don't run a separate lottery for each bedroom size or each income level. Um, all of the applicants get a lottery code. All of the codes enter the lottery. All of the codes come out of the lottery. Um, and that becomes the general list with all of the codes. When there is a local preference, the applicants who have local preference, their codes get entered into a local preference pool. And we run a lottery on the local preference and they have an order for local preference. 
those applicants that have local preference are also included in the general pool. Um, and the general pool becomes the waiting list after all the units are filled. So local preference applies only at lease up. So yeah. we have to do two lotteries, one for local preference and one for the general pool. And then okay. when we're going to fill units, you know, we have the list in the order based on the lottery. So if I know I have to fill five two bedroom 60% units, I'm going to start at the top and then sort down until I find the first, you know, 20 or so applicants that meet the eligibility criteria that can afford to pay the rent and then we'll invite them in for screening. Oh, if that makes okay. sense. Yeah, but they yeah, all go the same. They're all on the same list. Yeah. They're all on the same list. And so yeah. I've got lot for lack of a better term, lottery number one and lottery number two. All right. My two applicants. That's their, their lottery numbers. Um and the first the one is a wants a one bedroom and qualifies. The second one, then the second one wants a two bedroom and qualifies. In effect, they both go to the head of the, the pack for that um, type of unit. So you yeah. have, you don't have, you don't break it up by, we'd well, have to also break it up by um, 30, by 50, 60 and 80%, right? And market rates. So you have, you, you got a really complicated there's a lot. Yeah, but there's, there's a, a lot really that goes into it. selection process once you start mm -hmm. the process, but you have everybody in the same pool and then you start filtering them out based on both income and and um, uh, size of unit. Correct? Yep. Yep. And the first cut then you have a 70% local preference. Those are filled first. And then those people who don't meet that preference or uh, local preference people who didn't make it weren't awarded a unit are put into a, the second pool and you start the process for the remaining units with that second pool is that correct uh, not exactly okay well good. i know it's really Explain complicated it so um and uh, we haven't gotten to local preference but right. it's going to come up here anyway so yeah. we could talk about it so um so with local preference the the units are already designated before we even have the lottery. So if there's a 70% local preference and we know that we need to have X amount of one bedrooms, two bedrooms and three bedrooms set aside for local preference, we already designate those units as local preference units. Right. And then the other units are just general un units, right? So right. we have the local lottery pool, local preference lottery pool with that order. And then we have the general lottery pool where everybody's included, even the local people. So yeah. you could have a local applicant that could be like number 200 on the local preference list and number two on the general list, right? When they come out of the lottery because they have both opportunities. When we are going to screen for a local unit, which we know is a local preference unit because they're already designated at advance, we, we pull from the local preference pool to fill those units until we've screened all potential applicants that may qualify. If we go through the entire list of local preference applicants and we don't have a local preference to put into that local preference unit, then we'll put a general, a general pool applicant into that, into that unit. Um, when we're going to fill the general pool units, because we know which ones they are, they're already preset ahead of time, we just go down the list, down the general list. So it's it does happen. We've we've seen it with the lease up we're working now, where we have a local applicant going into a general preference unit, not a local preference unit, because they were high up on the general list, but down low on the local preference list. So they're not going into a local preference unit, but they're still going to get a unit during the initial lease up because of that general pool. So that's it's kind of like the different unit types. If it's local preference, we're pulling from the local pool until we've exhausted all of the local preference applicants. If it's a general unit, we start we we fill from the general pool. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. And then the, you know, preferences come into play. So if there's certain preferences, right? You have to skip down until you find the person that matches that preference. So uh, a big example of that is accessible units. Units that are wheelchair accessible, number 2000 could be the first person out of the lottery that needs that those features, right? So that we skip way down to them because that's who needs the features for a sensory unit, for a wheelchair accessible unit. Um, if there's other 
requirements like, you know, DMH referrals for FCF uh, unit types, like, you know, we have to go down till we get to those, those eligible people. Okay. Great. Ms. Williams, can you put that, uh, or is it Mr. Gruber, can you put the uh, screen back up or the PowerPoint back up? We can work through that again and then we can go on to local preference. Who has that? All right. Hang on one second. Great. And the last question I have is when you do your information sessions, are they, I suspect they're more than, they're done in more places than just in the town. You'll go out, depending upon what you find out from the census tract analysis, you'll go beyond just Amherst and go to other, have information sessions in other towns. Is that correct? Um, no. So the information sessions, we actually hold Zoom webinars for. So it's, it's a, uh, you know, public information across the whole state. It's not just advertised in the town or in the county or anything like that. So it's, um, all, so it's all Zoom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. It's it's not easy. Um, but we did we do live we do live Zoom webinars. Uh, we advertise. We let all of the applicants know. Um, anybody who's you know filled out an interest form gets emails with links and things like that so that they can join in. We also record them and then we post them to the website afterwards so that if someone didn't have an opportunity to join during a live webinar, um, they can watch the video back later. Uh, we also do, um, we have one session during the, uh, during the day, during a weekday, and then we have one session during a weekday in the evening hours, and then we do one weekend, like a Saturday afternoon session. So we hold three information sessions um, and we try to, uh, we typically do one, one of the sessions in both English and Spanish where we present the entire information session in English and then we present the entire information session in Spanish as well so that that gets recorded and it's available. Uh, we do Spanish just generally. It's the uh, biggest language that we have requests for translations for. So it's kind of an automatic thing for us at Wayfinders to translate um, documents into that language automatically. Um, I will take uh, Mr. Henry's advice though and look into the possibility of other languages uh, with translation services and stuff like that. Um, but that's, yeah, we just do, we used to have them in person um, and then when we did a couple of lease ups during COVID, we moved to Zoom. Uh, the majority, I don't, I don't think any management companies are doing in-person info sessions anymore or lotteries. Uh, it's all online, um, usually through a Zoom webinar. Yeah. So my only, this is for my information, so I can understand it, but my concern would, my concern would be that there are some populations that are le less likely to be um, at, to, to use Zoom than other populations. And I would guess that you've done this, you've had this policy for a while. Have you seen um, less, have you seen people, groups are not as likely to participate than they did in person sessions? It's, I'm just worried that you have very low income people who don't have a computer or don't, who aren't digitally connected as much. Yeah. And um, I wonder what your experience has been in terms of reaching out as broadly as possible and if going to digital has reduced the diversity of people you would normally see in a in-person session, just for our information. Um, I wouldn't say that. I would say our attendance has drastically increased by yeah. going to the Zoom webinar format. We had a few hundred people joining each of our information sessions in the lottery, uh, like two, 200 or so people. Um, the largest in-person info session I've done in the 10 years I've been here, I think we might have had 15 people at it. Um, really? and, and sometimes people don't show up at all and we just sit there for the hour and a half and, and then we leave. Um, with the Zoom webinars, it's definitely increased the attendance tremendously. 
Um, we do, you know, if we, we looked into with our last one, the possibility of renting a, a, a local space in the town and then setting up so that people could watch the Zoom webinar from there, uh, but it didn't end up panning out, but we still had really great attendance. We've had, uh, you know, we had people with the transcripts turned on because they were, you know, hard of hearing or, or deaf. Um, we were able to offer it in Spanish and English, uh, which definitely helped quite a bit of people out. Um, we do get, like, we do provide a dedicated email and a dedicated phone number for, on all of our marketing material for people to reach out if they have any questions, if they have any concerns, if they don't just know. Um, and, and for those who maybe weren't able to join the info session or sometimes they join and they, they weren't there the whole time or they missed a piece and they have more questions, we do a whole lot of uh, education individually with people as they call, as they stop in. Um, and as they email us, we'll have those conversations directly with with folks. And we provide assistance with, you know, filling out the application if it's something they struggle with. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, the the wave of the future, I guess. Everything is all, you mm -hmm. know, electronic and things like that. So. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Sloviter. I don't have a real good sense of the scale of this. You're going to be building about... 110, 115 units. How many applicants do you expect to get for that number of units? How many applications? Well, uh, we're in the process of filling 62 units in Agawam right now. We're opening there uh, any day. We'll have possession of the buildings. We had 2,438 applications for those 62 units. Wow. wow. Yeah, so I, I anticipate a lot. <laughs> it's only climbed. Thousands, you anticipate at least more. You anticipate 2,000 or more. I, I would be surprised if we didn't get that many. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Our I last agree. one prior to this. Oh, Jamie, when did we do Library Commons? Like three, four years ago, maybe? Uh, and we had about 1,700 applicants for those, uh, for that development in Holyoke. So we were anticipating getting a lot. Uh, for our last one, and when we were over 2,400, I was a little bit surprised, but not at all. I mean, the the need for affordable housing in this state is profound. It's absolutely profound. And unfortunately, we can't help them all. Uh, the majority of our applications come through, they, they're looking for subsidies. You know, they they need subsidies. They, they're eligible, they make under the income limit, but their rent is not affordable to them without a subsidy. So yeah, it's the numbers are huge. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, other questions on this first slide? Mr. Gruber, if there's not, we can go on to the next slide. I mean, I think we've touched on a lot of these topics, but I, this is a good um, um, reminder of the things that, they, that Mr. Gruber discussed. All right, next slide, any questions on, uh, let's go to the next slide, sample flyer. It is what it is. The next slide. We don't need to see the video again. <laughs> All right, before we move on to local preference itself, are there any other questions on the application selection process? Okay, let's talk about local preference. Jamie, you're on mute. Yeah, you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the, the screen that I'm sharing keeps covering my uh, my Zoom um, control bar, so it, that's why I was I was it was kind of popping on and off to try to remedy that problem. But I, that's um, so you can hear me now, though. Correct. Yes. All right. Well, Great. Um, so the um, Executive Office of Housing and Livable um, Communities, or EOHLC. Um, as uh, as part of their uh, qualified allocation plan, they'll they'll typically um, state in there that they may allow up to uh, seventy percent of uh, local preference um, at initial lease up for um, 
for tax credit uh, de development such as this. And um, as part of our, you know, our application there, we'll just, we'll show that there's a need for local preference and, um, and just, you know, ensure that it does not, you know, doesn't violate any sort of applicable fair housing laws, but that's um, the maximum that we would be able to uh, apply for in our funding application and Wayfinders is, um, you know, willing to, uh, you know, go through the, the, take the measures and the steps to um, apply for that, so. Okay. And can you show us, uh, can you show us the local, the local preference qualifications? Uh, do you have a, I think there was a, a piece of paper I saw that listed what qualifies for local preference, residency, job, school, um, just run through. Do you have that, a chart of that? Yeah, let me see if I can, uh, if I can find, find that here. Just and, while, yep. and, and, and while you look for that, is it 70% of the entire units or 70% of a certain amount of units? It, it would be 70% of the total units on the property. So you wouldn't be 70% of 30%, 70% of 50%, 70% of 60%. So you have to have the total. So you could have 60% of one group and 80% of another group. Um, it's, it's usually spread out pretty equitably. So it's spread out over a variety of income levels and apartment sizes, including, you know, if there were market units, there some market units would be included, some 80% units. So like our most recent one, we had the same thing, a 70% local preference. Um, so of the 62 units, 43 of them are designated as having local preference. And there are project-based subsidized units. There are 60% tax credit units, there's 80% workforce units, and there's market units included in that local preference designation. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Ehrlich, do you have something? Yeah. Just identify yourself for the record. And... Yes, I'm Bruce Ehrlich. I'm a uh, Senior Vice President for Real Estate Development at Wayfinders, and I'm grateful that I've been able uh, to finally Come into the meeting i've been listening um yeah one thing um i want to cl just clarify about what amanda said is amanda you can correct me amanda's the expert but but i just want to add another um sort of layer on that so a maximum so when we say 70 percent, that is the most that eohlc will approve there is no automatic approval that you can get 70 percent um local preference if we submit a request or when we submit a request to EOHLC for local preference, they will review it and make the determination of what's available. It's part of their overall fair housing review. Um, you know, it's kind of connected to the affirmative fair marketing plan. So we we make proposals, they they judge, and they're administering both state and local laws. So and not local, they're administering both federal and state kind of fair housing laws and policies. So, you know, they, they've, they've got both hats of state and, and a federal implementer. But here's the clarification. A maximum of 70% of the units could be local preference. Right. So let's say for simple math, we've got 100 units as the denominator. So up to 70% of 70 units could be local preference. Some units cannot have any local preference, okay, because of other laws like Section 8 units, Amanda, you can stop me when I'm wrong, Section 8 units, MRVP units, units set aside for people who are a clients of the Department of Mental Health or other priority populations that have targeted resources. So it's possible that those, is Amanda, am I on the right track here as, as clarification here? Yeah, so I mean, the local preference can overlap certain programming. Um, it's not it's not like a overlapping home with something else, right? Yeah. That's a little different. So I guess the, another way to think about that is though there's a seventy unit maximum in this high hundred unit property. If forty of the units could be sort of excluded from local preference because there's other restrictions. 
you know, then there would be only a maximum of 60 that are actually available for local preference. So, um, you know, the local preference um, allowance does not override other state or federal policies that target units and that that that, that don't allow um, local preference. And in that scenario, yeah. then it would be 70% of that 60? No, it would be 70% of the total number of units. So we're still 70%, 70 units is still the maximum. It's just that that's off of the 100, but it may be now. So let me get, give another example to illustrate. So if let's say only 20 units are in this special category that you can out of local preference. So there's a maximum of uh, there's 80 units that are theoretically available for local preference, but you would only be allowed to do 70 because 70 out of 100, 70 out of 100%. Um, okay. <laughs> if the number dropped down to 60 units that are available theoretically for local preference, then 100% of those 60 units would oh. be available for local preference, you know. Uh, or to hit the target on the head. If 70 units are available for local preference and that was it, 100% of them could be available. Amanda, did I get that right? Yeah, so it's that's, just not... yeah well, that's, that's about right. That's about right. only applies to those <laughs> units that don't have, don't already have some overriding um, limitation on local preference, like mm -hmm. federal, federal pro prohibition on the local presence, correct? Okay. Yeah. All right. So seventy percent applies to it in this case. If that's what you know, what we choose, seventy percent applies to that universe that is not governed by a federal or state law that prohibits local preference. Well, no, not exactly. The seventy okay. percent applies. Then I, then I, this is the really seventy percent applies to the seventy-eight units, which is the denominator. Okay. Yeah. Seventy percent of seventy-eight is the maximum number. Where do we get 78? We have 78. We get 78 units in the development. 78 so units for this. in the development. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was 100. Okay, you got 78. I was using 100 only as a hypothetical because okay. math is easier. All right, 78 for this Now I'm going to get to the fact. The fact. <laughs> okay. Actually, yeah. 78 units. Mr. Judge, you were making me doubt my... my, uh, my, my. You, you, yeah, you as well for me. Yeah, okay. No, okay. so... It's a 78 unit project up right. to 70% of those are available. It's just that some units may not be right. You know, they're not excluded from the 70% calculation. They're just excluded from local preference. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we should have another graphic for that. <laughs> yeah, we should have a graph, but I, Let's the, and that'd be helpful. But what I take away from this is that there are units which will not permit the, the to which local preference will not apply. Right? There are units yeah. out of your seventy-eight. There are units that will not apply because of the federal subsidy or some other or a state regulation, and that the those there may be seventy unit seventy percent of the seventy-eight units that. Um, local prep that we uh, could potentially use, but if 20 of those 78 units don't have, aren't, there's not allowed, local preference is not allowed to apply to those because of federal rules, then the, the rest of the units are, are local preference eligible or 70% of the rest of the units are local, local preference eligible, which do you understand my question? You got 78 units, 20 of them, are restricted from local preference. You're left with 58 units. Can those? Is it 70 percent of the 58, or is it all 58 that local preference applies to? The local preference would apply to all 58. Okay, got it. Yep. We don't. I don't need another chart then. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank it's, you. Yeah, and it would be up to 70 percent, right? Like right, we can right. propose and and send a HLC all the data. Uh, yeah. to show, demonstrate a need within the town because that's really what happens you have to demonstrate the need within the town for the local preference and then they'll tell us we're going to give you 
40% local preference or 50% or 60%. So they'll, they'll tell us what percentage of local preference that they're going to assign for us. Got it. Okay. And we do have, uh, I, I do, I, I don't know if, uh, if um, Jamie shared it, but we do have a local preference election uh, sheet that we attach with yeah. the applications that kind of walks through the, yeah, the yeah, criteria, yeah. what qualifies somebody for, yeah. uh, for local preference. That's what and I was this, referring to. In, yeah, and this yeah. was the last, oh. yeah. So we have the current residents, uh, municipal employees, employees of a business located in the town or households uh, with children um, attending the public schools. Mm -hmm. All right. I've dominated, I didn't mean to, but I've dominated the questions. I wanna make sure that other members of the board have an opportunity to ask questions on preference if they wish. Okay, anything else on local preference from Amanda or from either Ms. Bubon or Mr. Ehrlich? Mr. Brewer? Okay. All right. There's no further questions on local preference. Uh, let's go to the uh, follow-up for what uh, subject matters from the last meeting. Um, if I recall, the first thing that we talked about from the last meeting is the rental application. Uh, we received that. Um, Mr. Henry, you had a, you had requested to see that. Do you have some questions regarding the application? I think I did ask my questions, um, Mr. Mr. Chair. Thank you. After reviewing um, the application in earlier in our discussion tonight. So thank you. Okay. The second item was a comparison of inspections from state and other kinds. So we were, the goal here was to take the other inspections. This, this deals with whether this property would be subject to the rental registration inspections in Amherst. And the, the goal of this exercise was to take the Amherst inspection process and contrast that with the other inspection processes from processes from other agencies that apply to this project. Uh, are you still work? Are you guys still working on that? We don't have anything from you on that yet. Um, well, so we um, we had a we had a meeting with um, the the building commissioner and uh, the the planning staff. Um, to just discuss um, some of the information um, on the inspections and clarify um, the the regulations, um, you know, with our with our team. And um, following that conversation, um, we found that there are provisions actually in the bylaw to kind of waive the inspections in in sort of a real time um, manner um, for other buildings that are subject to. Um, inspections. So at the time of when an inspection may be required on one of these properties, we'd be able to submit those forms if, you know, if they were, um, you know, equivalent uh, for the the building commissioner, um, you know, review and, and that sort of thing. So uh, following that conversation, um, you know, we, we determined from our team that we would withdraw our um, request for a waiver um, from that and um, from the the rental bylaw or, or the um, or the fees. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Meadows had a question about the length of runs from the BRF to the terminal units. Um, can yeah, our mechanical engine. Our mechanical engineer, um, we had asked for that information and they are um, looking into it. It wasn't something that they had readily available, the exact, you know, lengths of each each run. So we're working on that with them. Is that something that you can have available in our next meeting, which is two, in two weeks? Do you think your, your engineering staff would have it available then? I I think that if if there's a um, if there's sort of a 
a route to the to the question that they may be able to answer. They may not have all the exact numbers. What I was told from our engineering staff is that that they would typically have those exact numbers later on um, in the construction drawing process. Um, we're still, you know, developing our 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 drawings um, to a certain level, and they they will be working on those eventually. Um, you know, and I know that the architect had asked, could we give sort of, you know, more general numbers as to what we anticipate them to be. And um, Mr. Meadows was 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 clear that he wanted the exact number. So um, that's something that we'll need to work on and I'll have to get a, you know, keep following up with them for a response. Um, all right. Well, I guess we'll wait until you have that ready. Mr. Meadows, what's your response to that? Okay. You're, you're muted, Craig. You're muted, Mr. Meadows. I would like to see them. And the, the reason for that is that the, there are limits with a VRF as to the length of runs that you can have. And some of those runs look longer than that to me. Uh, on the plans that we had, I wanted to just make sure that you're not going to exceed the, re, the limits that are available for a VRF. Would it be acceptable to have the engineers confirm that? No. I want to have my engineers confirm it. Okay. All right. So that's something that we'll need to get um, as soon as we can. All right. Um, the next, uh, Mr. Malloy, I see your hands up. Sure, thanks. I guess my question would be, if we knew the maximum length on each site of the run, is that acceptable? I mean, to me, this is really detailed. And so, although not prescribed by code, you know, all these line sets will be interior, they will be inspected. And so, you know, if the engineer can say the longest run on Belchertown Road is whatever it is, and the longest run on Southeast Street is what it is, is that good? We know that the, the rest would be less than that. I just, I think this is really detailed. Typically, we You're, you're breaking up, Mr. Uh, but you, Mr. Yeah. Meadows. I, I, I think you heard what I wanted. Okay. All right. The next uh, was to speak to neighboring properties about less light trespass. We had, did you have an opportunity to do that? And what's the uh, the, the upshot? Right. So uh, we're working with the architect and the photometric plan to um, hone in the design. Um, they're still working on that and updating it. And at that point, um, we will, you know, I'll discuss that with the with the neighbor at the at the property. But they're up, they're looking at some alternative options to, you know, reduce that um, even further. OK, so that's still to come. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And number five was clarification of uh, the variation in um light candles or foot is it light candles or foot candles i'm not sure um in various spaces on the on the ground and why they varied so much yes it's 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 foot candles and they're still okay. they're the, that that same that same vendor is still they working on it as well okay and that's yet to come all right so then for our outstanding um miss williams for our outstanding items we've resolved number one we've got the application that we resolved number two Three, four, and five still remain on our list of, of information to receive. Copy that. Okay. All right. Um, before we move on to, uh, to waivers and sort of an explanation of waivers and the first blush consideration of the waiver requests, I want to provide this opportunity for board members to add any, ask any questions on matters that we've gone through and. Uh, about anything before we move to waivers. So anything we presented before or tonight? I, I have a follow-up to the local preference. So sure. I, I understand that, um, I understand the math and the qualifications. And given what you said that your last project had significantly greater applicants than units, and I imagine Amherst will also. But 
what happens if um, we don't have those um, local preference residents applying for these units? How do you treat those that were essentially adapted for local preference if you don't have the numbers to fill those? Yeah, so if we uh, were trying to fill a local preference unit, we didn't have any local preference applicants that met the criteria to be eligible and affordable for that, we would uh, fill it with a general pool applicant. So it would go to just an applicant from the, the list. Uh, remember, because we have the two different lists, right? We do a local lottery and then we do a general lottery. All local applicants are also included in the general lottery with general applicants. So if we're going to fill a unit that's a designated local preference, we're going to go to the local preference lottery list first, screen anyone from there that may be potentially eligible before that unit would be offered to someone from the general list. So it does happen. It does happen sometimes, you know, uh, like we have some three bedroom 80% units that we don't have maybe a local applicant for or something like that. And we would have to go to the general pool for that. And the, the local preference is at lease up only. So it's just on the initial filling of the development. Once all of the units are filled, uh, the general list, the general lottery list is what becomes the initial waiting list. So people keep their lottery placement and that's their number on the waiting list um, for the units for ongoing filling for vacancy and turnover. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Um, Chair. Are, excuse me, are students at UMass eligible to apply for units in these buildings? So uh, there are student status requirements, uh, mostly under the low housing tax credit program, uh, where there's restrictions in place. Um, so it's not that a student couldn't apply or that a student may, may or not be eligible. Um, but there's prohibitions under the low income housing tax credit program that prohibits renting to households that consist of all full time students. So if you have three or four household members, every single one of them is a full time student. It, there's a, a prohibition against that unless they meet a certain exception criteria. There are exceptions to that rule, um, such as uh, if it's a, a single parent with dependent children and they're all full-time students, they would be accepted from that. They they would be allowed to have a, a, a all full-time student household. If it's a married couple and they file a joint return and they're both full-time students, that's another one of the exceptions that's allowed for us to rent. It's the, the full-time student status rule is really designed to prevent dormitory style housing and affordable programs is what it is. So uh, even if we've had single individuals, that were full-time students, if they're a former foster child a former, uh, under former care of the state, they're exempted too from that rule uh, to try to you know help them out in that regard. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. And, I, and I read your lease. There are restrictions in the lease. You have to certify, you have to certify to that in your lease, correct? To those, that you meet those requirements. Yeah, yes, there is language in the lease document about that tax credit regulation. Um, that if, you know, they may move in and be initially eligible and then later on during their tenancy where we have to recertify their income and assets and their household composition annually. And uh, sometimes they decide to go to school full time and they become ineligible at that point. And then once their current lease term is, is expired prior to their next annual recertification, they have to vacate. They have to vacate the unit if they don't meet one of the exceptions. Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so this is gonna sound a little odd to begin with. I apologize, roll with me. Um, but I myself uh, spent approximately one year living on the streets as an unsheltered individual. Um, this is something that I'm very passionate about, very knowledgeable about having gone through it firsthand. And I applaud you guys for applying such a high percentage uh, to the 30% AMI marker. My, the reason why I mentioned uh, my kind of personal struggles, obviously well over a decade ago with being an unsheltered person is 
it teaches you things that you just can't know if you hadn't lived through that. Uh, it presents lists of obstacles that normal people just would never even think. So lots of times when people are trying to lend a hand, they're maybe not doing it in the most efficient way or a way that's actually truly equitable. Uh, so to that point, when it comes to the laundry rooms, I know you guys discussed them a lot last week. Uh, one thing that really stuck out to me was it seems like there's a complete lack of coin service on the machines. Um, what you're presupposing in that is I pulled up the statistics actually while I was watching the meeting. 97% of the United States, according to Pure Research, has a phone, access to a cellular phone. 89% have a smartphone. When you're talking about this demographic, most of them are not going to have a laptop, a tablet, a cell phone sitting around. Their internet access is very limited. And I can fully understand that for the purposes of things like Zoom meetings and stuff like that because i understand that you do have to operate within costs but in order to clean your clothes and to pay to clean your clothes it's not like you know this is a free service you're already presupposing that someone has a smartphone or internet access that's readily available um i don't know that that's have you spoken to the vendor to see if a coin operating machine might be possible? Well, we do have cards. So in the laundry room, there will be a machine that they could put dollars into to get a card to use okay. on the equipment. So there is a cash option, um, just not to put like quarters into the machines. Okay. Yeah, there, okay. there's going to be a um, an option for them to buy it, to get like a laundry card. They'll load the money. They could put the card in, load money onto it. Once they get a card, they could keep the card for their entire tenancy if they want to. Um, and, and they could load it that way. So there there is that cash option too. Okay, excellent. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's good. All right, Mr. Meadows. Uh, I have a question, I think maybe more for Mr. Malloy. Uh, I was getting my car inspected the other day and I noticed um, the, the Belchertown Road site and there's no crosswalk there. Is there going to be a crosswalk and is there going to be a, a, a light for that crosswalk so that it can halt traffic going each way and allow people who are, are crossing over to Colonial Village to catch the bus? Yes, so the town is working on that section of Route 9 or Belchertown Road, and there will be a crosswalk with, you know, rapid flashing beacons that would bring you right to the, uh, you know, right where the curb cut is for Colonial Village and right to the bus stop. So from the site plan on Belchertown Road, you could walk out the front door, follow the walkway, which will lead right to the crosswalk, and then you can get to Colonial Village and the bus stops. Great, thank you. Yep. And Mr. Malloy, that's one of those that you push the button and lights flash. Is that right? Right. The one, yes, yeah, the ones that have like a yellow sign and then the four rectangular lights, yep. you know, facing each direction that flash. Yes. Like we have on Amity. Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. No other questions. We'll move to it's seven twenty-two. Um, we're going to take our five-minute break right here. That's a good. Yes, Mr. Gruber. Oh. Just, um, yeah, just before we break, I'd like to address the um, the waivers. Um, we are currently working on responses to the waivers that we received from the town staff that we plan to send back um, to the oh. town staff for their review prior to our next meeting. So discussing them tonight, it would be in sort of advance into that. We're not prepared to do so because we have comments that will go back to the town for their review um, and then we we could discuss that would be um, how how we would see this kind of um, moving forward with the waiver so we're not able to discuss them this evening okay um, so you're you're going to submit the result of your conversations which I was I was unaware of <laughs> The result of your conversations with the town is that you might 
amend your waiver request beyond just the rental registration waiver. There's, we'll see a different waivers in two weeks than we have before us now. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. Then I don't think it makes, I'll listen to the board, but it doesn't make sense to go over these waivers if these waivers are going to be different in two weeks. Um, but I was unaware of that you had conversations regarding the waivers and um, and I, I wish I would have known that then we wouldn't have planned to, I, I wouldn't have spent all afternoon reading the waivers. <laughs> okay, all right, that's good. All right, um, board members, um, I don't know that there's anything else to discuss for this application then tonight if we're not ready to do the waivers. And the way it seems to me that it's a waste of our time to do something to review something that's going to be changed. So, um, Mr. Malloy. Yeah, sure. So staff reviewed them a while ago, sent them to Wayfinders. I will say that most of the waivers will remain. Uh, some of it was just, um, you know, clarification on what section of the zoning bylaw it's referring to or listing out all the standards and conditions from the bylaw, you know, being more explicit in the language in terms of what is being asked to be waived. And so, you know, there was a few sections we thought they might need to um, request a mm -hmm. waiver from that weren't included, but for the most part, you know, I think, you know, the waivers are there. Um, we, we thought we could eliminate a few. And so, you know, I, I think your review is still worthwhile because most of that language is gonna remain even in the changes. Uh, we don't know which ones you're not gonna. Right, right, no, no, I'm saying not to review tonight, but I think it was oh, good to good. look at them just to, you know. Great, yeah, yeah. all right, good to know, all right. Any other um, comments regarding this application from the board members tonight? Anything else that the applicant wishes to say? Anything else from staff? If not, uh, I would entertain a motion that we continue this until. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Murray. If there's any uh, public comment. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, if anybody from the public wishes to speak on this matter, uh, they should do so by using the raised hand function on his on his or her screen or by pressing star nine on the phone. Um, do we have attendees who wish to speak? No, Mr. Chair, we do not. All right. So then we'll renew our new my willingness to entertain a motion to continue this hearing uh, until November 14th, at which time it looks like we've got a, a half day for a half meeting for Wayfinders and a half meeting for the Shrewsbury Solar um, project on the 14th. Do I have such a motion? So moved. And so I heard a move and a second. So the mo any discussion? If not, the vote occurs in the motion to continue this till six o'clock on November 14th. If there's no discussion, the chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Sloboda? Aye. Vote is five to nothing. Uh, motion carries. And we'll see you all in uh, on November 14th. Hopefully we'll be able to have um, some of that information that Mr. Meadows is interested in, as well as the other things on um, uh, the, light prop, the light trespass and the uh, sort of the irregularities from our standpoint on the photo, volt, photo metric studies. All right, next order of business is um, public comment on any matter not before our board tonight. So the public can comment on any matter not before us tonight. If you wish to comment, please use the raise hand function on Zoom or press star nine on your phone. Ms. Williams, I don't see any raised hands. That is correct. There are no raised hands. If not, the next order of business is um, business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. Let's just run through the schedule, which is we normally do, Ms. Williams. Um, seems to me that we've got a hearing on next week on the 24th that deals with 328 College Street 
and 47 Redgate Lane. And we have a full panel for that. I will be absent, but you have a full panel for that, correct? That's correct. One moment, let me share my screen. But yes, that is correct. So the 24th, we have 328 College Street and 47 Redgate Lane. Okay. Then we have meetings on, we have a half a meeting dedicated to Wayfinders on the 14th and a half on uh, Streetsbury Solar. Is there any development on the extent to which we'll have um, um, documents or a presentation from Streetsbury Solar? At this time, I don't have any additional documentation. I think I have a few um, comments from the public, but that's about it. And I think I can just give an update on WSP and where they are, but we don't have any additional documentation for Shootsbury. Okay, so if we don't have a lot we, from Shootsbury Road, we'll spend most of our time on Wayfinders then on the 14th. And then the next meeting before Thanksgiving is on the 21st. Okay. All right, any other business from members of the board? If not, I'd entertain a motion to um, adjourn. So moved. Moved. Moved and second. This is not debatable. The chair votes aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you for all your help. Have a we'll good night, you. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.